to Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Today is a very special day for conservation. It's World Rhino Day, and I guarantee you that most stories you hear will be tragic, depressing, and defeating. While it is important to be fully aware about the tragedies our rhinos have faced, Today, I want to bring you a different story, a story of hope, determination, and perseverance. In this episode, we're sitting down with Mark Butcher, more commonly known as Butch, the founder and managing director of Envelo Safaris in Hwangi, Zimbabwe. Butch began his career in the early 80s as a ranger for the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Management in Hwangi National Park. But instead of it being a dream job prancing through the bush, Butch quickly realized that his work mostly entailed killing, quote unquote, pest animals and putting local people in jail for hunting bush meat within park boundaries. The conflict didn't slow after he ended his career as a ranger and became a provincial wildlife officer for Zimbabwe's Forestry Commission. During his time working for the government, he watched a wave of highly trained poachers come into the country and kill all of Zimbabwe's rhinos. He knew there had to be a better solution for protecting wildlife and providing livelihoods to the people living closest to the park. That's when Envelo Safaris was born. Envelo is a true conservation tourism company that's fully committed to meeting the needs of the local community and native wildlife. Since its inception in 1996, Envelo has become a leader in community-based tourism throughout Southern Africa. Butch's vision and dedication reached new heights in May of this year. After five years of planning, two male southern white rhinos were reintroduced to the Hwangi ecosystem on community lands outside of the park through the Community Rhino Conservation Initiative. Butch and I have a marvelous conversation about his time as a ranger, how he discovered ecotourism as a way to empower the community surrounding the park while protecting wildlife, what it was like watching the last rhino being shot in his country, and why he took on the massive project of safely and sustainably bringing rhinos back to Wangi. In addition to today's conversation, we have two exciting ways that you can support rhino conservation. First, if you'd like to visit the two rhinos being safely managed by Envelo and the community, my work, The Wild Source, has put together a special itinerary that you can book to go see these rock star rhinos in person while also having a fantastic safari experience. Second, we're launching a fun t-shirt campaign for rhinos in partnership with the Katie Adamson Conservation Fund. The shirt was designed with the incredibly talented Way In Away and proceeds from now until October 1st, 2022 will be donated to KACF for their numerous rhino conservation projects. After October 1st, the shirt will continue to be live in the Rewildology store on the website and a portion of every sale will be donated to KACF. I couldn't be more excited for this campaign and I'd love for all of you to come with me to see the rhinos at Envelo while wearing your rhino shirt. How freaking fun does that sound? Links for the itinerary and t-shirts are in the description of today's episode and in the show notes at Rewildology.com. One last announcement before we get to the conversation promise I'm almost done. Butch refers to several maps and images that might make more sense to see as you listen, and so I've time-stamped each image in the show notes. If you'd like to watch Butch explain the visuals as we chat, then check out this episode on Rewildology's YouTube channel. All right, everyone, here is my super inspiring conversation with Butch. Well, hi, Butch. Thank you so much for coming on the Rewildology podcast today and sharing this very special day, which is World Rhino Day. And of course, we're going to get so deep into your very amazing recent work with rhinos. But that is so far from where this story begins that we need to go all the way back and start from square one. So you discovered conservation tourism in a rather interesting way. So please tell me, tell all of us, what is your winding journey that led to Envelo Safaris and what you're doing today? All right. Well, evening to you, Brooke. Thanks a heck of a lot for inviting me to talk here. You know, I feel feel very, very proud of some of the stuff that we've done with this Rhino project and I just love talking about it, you know. And to answer your question, 
I first came to Wangi as a, a cadet ranger with the Department of National Parks and Wildlife back then in 1980. Okay, and back then in the 1980s, when you're working in Wangi, he was a huge 5,000 square mile national park. Uh, and as young rangers, we spent our life looking after the wildlife and uh, living, frankly, in paradise. You know, it was a, a young man's dream, you know, and I'd always grown up wanting to be a game ranger from a very, very young age. But what I found is that after later on being five, 10 years or so there, is that what, what our role really was back then in that kind of post-colonial era was we inherited a conservation model from our colonial past that was setting up these national parks. And it's not just in Zimbabwe, it happened elsewhere in South Africa, via East Africa, all over Kenya and Tanzania as well. They set up these national parks where there were animals and then there were people on the outside. Okay. And people on the outside, the local people were really cut off from the parks. Okay. So there was often fences, there were often hard boundaries and people were that side, animals were this side. And if people came into the park, they were poaching or collecting firewood, whatever it was, but they were breaking the law. So they'd get arrested and thrown in jail often. And if animals went out, they were up to no good because the elephants were going into the communal areas or tribal areas. They were probably raiding crops if lions were going out. They were raiding livestock and sometimes even killing people. So we spent our lives throwing people into jail and controlling wildlife, you know? And by the late 1980s, there really was a big eureka moment for a lot of the people who were role models to me in conservation. And we were all as young players as the foot soldiers of the conservation in our country, we were all arriving at the same place too. And that was frankly, that we were swimming uphill. I mean, swimming upstream, you know, uh, it was just, we, we just weren't, we weren't winning. We were just fighting with people. There were these low intensity guerrilla warfare type situation scenarios around our park boundaries with people being thrown in jail, angry people, angry communities, wildlife that was being shot too many of it, too much of it unnecessarily. We all said, okay, we need to find a better way. You know? And that was what today is a bit of a duh, is these community-based tourism conservation models, you know? But back when, when we started, it was, it was, it was a very, very heavy lift. You know, we had to, we had to try and get communities who we'd been at war with the week before, the month before to say, hey guys, let's, let's get together. Let's rethink what we're doing here. And let's try and get tourism benefits uh, out of the parks and into the communities around us and not going to central government, not going to multinational hotel companies. But let's try and let's try and get the benefits of living next door to this paradise we call Wangi. Let's get the benefits of that going to the local communities. So suddenly now, when an, when an elephant uh, stands on a, a watermelon, where once upon a time it was a very very serious big thing, you know. But nowadays, now with a lot of communities, ah, not such a big thing, you know. Elephants eating a, a watermelon. Do we really need to d destroy it? No, probably not, because there's tourists coming next week and they're going to spend some money buying curios. And hey, you know, we've got two of our kids who are working in the safari camp. But so, so that's the paradigm shift we've been trying to get to. And uh, that's what we've really frankly achieved in, in, in a large part of our district. There's still a lot of areas we still need to spread it to, but I'm very, very confident that we've developed a model that works and where we've arrived at with this rhino thing is finally the pinnacle of all this work in the past. Well, frankly, it's, it's very, very close to 40 years, but we started with the tourism programs in the 1990s, you know, so it's 30 years of work. It hasn't been, hasn't, hasn't been easy, you know, very, very heavy lift. Fantastic. Yeah. So let's just stick with these early days for a while, because I would really love to learn just how all of this came to be. Was there another solution that you were debating at the same time? Because like you said, this conservation based tourism thing really didn't exist at the time. Was there another thing that you tried or was this the only thing and you put all eggs in this basket? Yeah. You know, when I, well, as, as a young ranger, when we when I and my contemporaries, when we came to work, there was already something there that was working, okay? And, and it had been in place and developed and it, it, was, it was how things were done. And animals were look, very, very well looked after inside the parks. And frankly, probably better than the communities outside the park, certainly neighboring us. The elephants inside the park, they had diesel engines pumping water for them back then. Today we use solar, but in the communities outside, they had to pump their own water by hand. It's just one example. And of course, communities saw that and said, well, that's not really, not really fair, you know? Mm -hmm. And lodges and camps were built inside parks in concessions. One of the stories I talk about, and it's a kind of a thing that I always remember, and I, I talk about it, but it's a thing that still I, I remember clearly is we used to go to Victoria Falls on weekends, often when we had a weekend off as, as young rangers. And I remember driving on the road between Victoria Falls Airport and Victoria Falls Town, 
Victoria Falls town was full of hotels owned by multinational companies. And uh, it was a, a tourism hub even back then, you know, mm. people from all over the world used to come, they used to fly into Victoria Falls airport, and then they'd drive into town in buses and stuff. I remember driving into town and watching tourists throwing candy out of windows to the kids on the side of the road, and these kids scram scrabbling on the side of the road. And these were the kids essentially that were growing up in the shadow of the smoke of Mozi Watinua, you know, the smoke that thunders, this incredible natural wonder of the world. And the best they could get was tourists throwing candy at them, you know? And that was, that was, you know, these were these images that were just so stark and saying, man, this is not cool. You know, this is really not cool. These kids ought to be getting more out of, you know, being part of the Victoria Falls environment than just having candy thrown at them. So, you know, those kind of things, it was, it was all those kind of different things. We're all kind of looking at it and thinking, man, we need to, we need to change this thing that we've had. There, there's an interesting one as well is that Wangi's elephant population Today, you know, we've got nearly 50,000 elephants. And I talk about elephants a lot because they are the larger part of the biomass in the Wangi. But when the park was first set aside as a game reserve, there were only about a thousand elephants back. Oh, wow. So human wildlife conflict was probably not a big thing. Okay. So the conservation that we did within the park was so super successful. We created this, this incredible elephant population that wasn't there historically for a variety of reasons that I won't get into here. But so now the human wildlife conflict that developed was created by the conservationists, the game rangers. So suddenly again, you know, we're responsible for taking care of these people and taking care of stuff. So lots of different elements here that all kind of feed together. There's another element that I talk about a lot is that it's probably the same throughout Africa and maybe the world is that the best social services in a country or in a, a province or in a state or usually in the capital city or bigger cities. And as you get further and further away from those cities, so the standard of the hospitals, the standard of the schools, maybe gets less and less. And it's exactly that in Zimbabwe. And actually the sad truth is that the poorest schools, the worst run schools, the worst run clinics and hospitals are the ones that are in servicing the communities that border our park in these very remote areas. So again, these communities are not only having to deal with the wildlife that's overflowing from the parks, but they're getting the double whammy of that they're not really being taken care of very well anyway. But they're living next door to paradise. You know? It would certainly paradise as it's perceived by international safari goes. So, well, yeah, that answer it. Yeah, no, that that was that was perfect. So that because that does solve and check so many different boxes by creating this community-based tourism. And I have to ask too, staying on these early days. You mentioned that it sounded like it went a little interesting. How did those first meetings go with the community? How did the how did you approach them and make this connection happen that obviously is insanely strong and thriving today? But how did you do that? <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was very very difficult. Obviously, we, because we had been living there for so long, we knew a lot of the community leaders, uh, and the community leaders are often the traditional leaders, the headmen, the village heads, the chiefs. And then also there's elected leaders, you know, councillors and local politicians. And then there's community leaders such as headmasters, such as heads, you know, school heads and those kind of things that are kind of well known. So those are the kind of people that, that we, we knew and we would talk to. And uh, we'd say, hey guys, you know, you know, are you interested in kind of starting a tourism project? You know, let's start getting going with tourism. And again, in that area where we are today, exactly where that rhino sanctuary is that we just created, I remember taking a lot of time and effort to call a community meeting where we we're going to start talking about this stuff. And I think four people came. Mm. This is a community that was where of several hundred families, you know? And I remember again, you just get this feeling, wow, you know? But again, a lot of it was lack of trust, you know? A month before they, they, you know, we've been throwing people in jail and breaking up families because guys have been called poaching. And often what we perceived as poaching was often just trying to get some meat to feed with your family, which as illegal as it might be in terms of the, the law was set by the government, is maybe not seen to be illegal out there. It means it's taking care of your family on one side. The other side is that where, because the elephants have eaten all your food and the elephants come from the national park, why shouldn't you go to the national park and go, go and get a, a wildebeest so you can feed your family because the parks took away your food. So I'm going to go and get some more food from them. So poaching that we were dealing with back then wasn't this, uh, the stuff that's publicized so much now, you know, the ivory poaching and the rhino horn poaching, it's all done, you know, this very, very commercialized syndicates that operate today. Uh, but most of what we were dealing with was kind of uh, 
what, what people call today bush meat poaching. So it's how people hunting for, for meat. So to get back to what you were saying, okay, so people didn't really want to come and have a meeting with us. But I'll never forget, and it's very, very interesting, and it's, and it's kind of pertinent to the audience we're talking to today, is there was a guy, and I wish I could remember his name now. I must, I must take some time and get it. But he was a, a field officer working with USAID at the time in Harare, our capital. And he'd heard us talking about what we were doing out there. And obviously, we didn't have any money to get started with. So I remember talking to him. And a couple of us were brainstorming with him. And we said, look, let's do a couple of community-type projects. And that'll get everybody's attention. And what we cottoned on to, we said, we'll drill three wells. Okay. And in those areas, there is no, there's, you know, the, the water all, all the, uh, comes out of pans, water holes that are full of parasites and really unhealthy and muddy and whatever. But there's a lot of clean water underground. You know, so you drill a borehole, you, you call it a well, you stick a, a, a pump on top and you pump clean water up and you've got clean, healthy water, which of course everybody really, really, really wants in, the, in those areas. Back then, there weren't many wells. And USAID funded the first three wells in our area. And I remember when we finished the third one and commissioned it, and it was a sort of couple of months of work, I called a village meeting, and man, there were like 200, 300 people. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it really was. This was a epiphany moment for us as well, because people talk as easy, you know? What people wanted to see, they wanted to see something. And it was from those kind of, and in fact, interestingly, at least two of those wells still work today. Nearly 30 years later, they saw people every day getting clean water from it. So it's kind of cool. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it just shows that you had the investment. It's like you have to put actions behind your words. It's like you can talk until you're blue in the face, but until we see you actually commit to us and our community, I'm not going to listen to you. I can't blame yes. them. I'm from a very yes. royal place myself. It's the exact same mentality. It's like until you actually show that you mean what you say, I'm, I don't care what you say. Like, you know, so that is fantastic to hear. So then how did the tourism start? Like what was... Maybe how did your first lodge come together? And like, what year was that? And how did that, how did, I guess, how did Envelo come to be? Okay. So we, at the time now we're talking, what part of what that program started, that community-based programming. And in Zimbabwe, we called it Campfire. And resources back then were owned by central government. So on communal lands, which were tribal lands, I mean, we call them communal lands in uh, Zimbabwe. So the resources, the timber, the wildlife is all owned by central government, okay? But it's in trust to a local community, okay? But really, at the end of the day, an animal belongs to the state. So what the legislation, the big tipping point was, was having to get legislation rewritten to have ownership of the resources delegated from central government in Harare, our capital city, down to a particular area. And at the time, it was devolved down to district level. Okay, and, and now that then gave them the, 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 the authority to be able to, to, to sell the rights to access to wildlife or, or timber or anything else. So, so that's where we started. Again, at the time, a lot of mistrust. I remember talking to people about leases. And I remember the first lodge we built on community land back then was Gorge's Lodge up near Victoria Falls, which is now closed, sadly. But at the time, a guy said, yeah, okay, sounds like a great idea. And the idea here was to take tourists instead of staying hotels owned by multinationals in town is come and stay in a lodge outside of town on, but on communal land where royalties from that lodge would be going to local community and be hiring local community members, work, et cetera, et cetera. But they said, okay, you know, I will give you a one year lease. You, know? you say, well, okay, guys, yeah, that's cool. But you know, one year, I can't <laughs> yeah. one year. And after months and months and months of negotiations, they finally gave us two years. And that was a huge, huge how do I say it? it was very, it was a huge leap for them in terms of, of faith. And again, I mean, that spoke to the, the banks and everywhere, the bank kind of said, no, okay, so it can't work. but we started building. And as soon as we started building and, and got things going there, suddenly now we it, it, it increased our credibility with local community. And suddenly now you can start saying, hey, we need five, 10 pieces. And actually where the rhino sanctuary is today, that area there, communities, they, they wouldn't budge from that one year, two year, these kind of things. So. We we're having a real difficult time with it, but what we ended up doing was on some forest land outside of the park, but right adjacent to where that is now today, uh, the Forest Commission gave a lease and there we got a lease there and which is where our Lodge Bomani Lodge is today. And that was a lodge outside the park, not on communal land, but outside the park. So it was a, a step in the right direction in terms of peripheral development, moving stuff out of the park. And it was half a mile from, from the communal land. 
So it's walking distance for staff and for people into the common land. So it really became a stepping stone. And once that happened, and people started to come there to see what tourism was, they were there. No, I mean, tourism was, they didn't be able to go into a park legally. So they could come there and visit the camp and visit the lodge and see things. Then they said, okay, okay, let's start talking on. And then eventually when we took the next step, which was to build a lodge on the community land, they, they gave us a lease, but they were very, 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 very serious about, they didn't want anything to do with tents. Okay. Mm. Quarry camps of tents, you know, you can't guys build tents is what the, this is what the tourists want, you know, come and stay in a tent and, and for a variety of reasons, tents are low impact and all kinds of good things like that, you know? So they, I remember the chief at the time, chief, but to pull up older chief, his son now is, is the, is the chief, but at the time, the older chief who was a wonderful old man, gray haired, very walked into the room, he had great presence and gravitas and really was everything. I was, you have huge respect for him. He was, he was actually a, a head of a school, you know, he was that for what he did in his, in his, as his, as his work, as a career. But I remember he stood up and said, okay, we'll go ahead with this project of yours, but you need to build something here that'll be here for our children's children. So wow. they insisted that we build a lodge. Um, and okay. So a lot of people come to Camelthorn Lodge today, which is uh, one of our other lodges and said, man, this is kind of different. You know, why did you do this? And it wasn't because what we wanted, it was because what, that's what the community wanted, right? Community land. So, and again, that's another very important element, community-based conservation isn't about what tourists want. It should be about what the community wants. And if we are sincere as ecotourists, we should respect that. And we should say, okay, well, this is, this is how things need to be done here. Let's, let's go with that, you know? And again, it's just, it's just how things shifted. Today, of course, community-based conservation is all over Africa. And I know back then in the 1990s, people, people from Namibia, people from Tanzania, all over Africa were coming and visiting us in Zimbabwe. And I remember talking, uh, examples where people from Botswana came and talking and said, okay, how do you do this? How do you do that? And one of the things we said at the time was that we had devolved authority down to district level. We said, we, in hindsight, years later, we found out that was less good because what you need to do is to devolve power from district level all the way down to village level, mm. get, get it as low as you can, because ultimately the lowest level is the people who are the custodians of that resource, the custodians of this tree here or this animal here are the people who live right here, not the people who live 50 miles away, you know, which is where the, the district capital is. So those are the kind of things we had learned. And that's part of the reason Namibian community based, and they call it C CBNRM, I think, or I, think CBNRM, I don't know what the acronym is, but they, that's why they are a community based programs that work so well, because they, they right from the outset really devolved that authority down to the lowest level. Anyway. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And so I think that the next logical question here is maybe for someone who hasn't quite been on safari before or has not been in, I guess, like a classic, more setup versus your style. How is your style of tourism different? And like, maybe you don't have to name any names. We don't need to name any names. Maybe if there's another business or another safari company that you can think of off the top of your head that might run it a little differently, if you know what I mean. So how yeah, sure. does, how does your eco lodge based work versus maybe some of the other big players that maybe you and me don't support as much? We'll just say that. <laughs> yeah. Look, they, they, I, I can say this, frankly, that back in the 1990s in particular, okay, the typical safari going tourist who was visiting our country would fly into Victoria Falls, probably have a night or two at a big, 100 room hotel, oh, you see foreign owned. And then they would fly in a charter aircraft, land at a camp in the middle of the national park, spend a week at that camp or another camp nearby, drive around, look at all the animals, wonderful experiences, and then jump on a plane and fly back to Victoria Falls and then fly home. With, and that would be how it would work. And they'd have a, they'd had a safari, a wonderful safari, you know? Um, what we're trying to do is to say, okay, that's all. All well and good, but what about people? Okay. And we've established here that our protected areas in particular our national parks will not survive into the next generation, into the long-term future, unless we involve the communities that live around our parks. They are part of the park. You can't divide them. So how do the communities around the park benefit? I remember back in the day, you know, those hotels and those lodges inside the parks used to typically be staffed by the best chefs you could get. So they were hiring chefs and hiring people from the capital city, from hotel schools, 
Again, they weren't hiring. They're saying they're hiring local, yes, from the country, but not how we hire local today. And the kind of things we do is when I say we hire local, I mean, I'm talking people who come from within walking distance of the park, we certainly have one of our lodges. This is what I call local. You need to be an hour or two, within an hour or two's walk of us, otherwise you're not local. Um, and you certainly need to be talking in the belly lane uh, on yeah. our side, uh, which is the language of, of, uh, of the people who live on the southern boundary of Angie. On the north side, people talk uh, Nambia, you know, and if you're not a Nambia speaker, how, how local actually are you, you know? So, but of course, one of the things that we ran into quickly was that we couldn't find any licensed professional guides within that village, within those villages. So now we have to carefully select professional guides who are in Dibele speakers, as an example, who have some cultural links with, and then bring those guys in as senior now, and, and now start hiring out of the local community and, and apprenticing them to those kind of people. And after five or 10 years, suddenly you've got a very, very, very hot shot guiding team that are from that village right over there. And, and, and then, then to take that further is that when we bring tourists to come visit us, we go and do the game drives. You go and do the walking and tracking with elephants and walking and, and at water holes and bush dinners and bush lunches and all the very cool things that we do in Wangi with wildlife. But even more, more importantly, we always go and spend at least a morning, and often more than that, in the local community. You know? And I've seen community village visits done, particularly around the falls. I'm sorry to be hopping on the falls all the time. Probably I'm being a bit unfair, but where you get a bunch of tourists from overseas and they go to a school, you know, and they all, all these tourists all stand there and they'll look at them. All the kids are over there and they stand and look at the tourists, you know, it's like, it's like ET meeting uh, planet earth, you know, and they'll all, they all sing a nice song and everybody hands out money. And then they all go back to the hotel in the falls and have right. you know, Chardonnays and something you're wrong for lunch, you know, and it's kind of, whoa, and it's just uh, it's so artificial, you know? So uh, how we like to try and do it is to go to the communities where us, it, and I, I consider myself part of that community. I've been there for 40 years, you know, we go into our own communities there. And all of my guides come from the school. When we go and visit the school, they're all alumni of that school. You know, they know the headmaster, they know all the kids' names, all the kids know our, us, our names. And it's very much like meeting the neighbors, you know. If I was to come and visit you, I'm sure you might want to take me around to your next door neighbor and, hey, meet this guy from Zimbabwe. You know, he's got all kinds of fun stories. And that's more of what our village visits are. We've got some friends over here who have come from America or come from any part of North America. And, hey, let's go and meet our friends, meet our neighbors, you know. And now, the whole thing becomes different, you know, the kind of thing we do when we go and do a school visit, instead of going and standing at the school and all looking at each other, love walking to school with the kids. You know, all our kids walk to school. They don't go to school in the buses and some of them walk, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight kilometers to school. And what a great way to start the morning. You know, you leave your lodge, have a nice continental breakfast, and then head down to one of the villages and jump out of the, your safari car and join in a, a group of kids walking to school, you know, and kick a ball and chit chat. And, you know, wonder wonders, it's great opportunity for these kids now to meet people, you know, and how great is that for their education? Where are you from? Oh, I'm from San Francisco. Where is San, San Francisco? California. California. California is in, is that near New York? No, that's over there. Just all these different things. What do you do? Oh, I'm an airline pilot. Wow. Okay. What do you do? To, I'm an airline pilot. Okay. Well, you've got to go to school. You've got to go to high school. You've got to go to university. You've got to get some qualifications and all these kind of chit chats going on. And you can see it's really inspirational. For kids. And it helps build self-confidence and it helps just get away from that horrible image of these tourists driving past throwing candy out of bus windows, you know? It's just, let's just get away from that and get as far away from it as possible. And what we end up happening is these kids are growing up and suddenly now they're looking at tourism differently to how their parents looked at it. Mm. And, you know, when, uh, when I first went and spoke to their parents or maybe their grandparents now and said, okay, what about tourism? Yeah, they all shook their heads at me. Suddenly now these kids, what are they, what's happening now? They're kind of growing. What are they thinking about? They're saying, man, I want to be a guy, man, I want to. I don't want to fly. I want to fly a charter airplane. You know, man, I want to do this, man. You know, instead of wanting to go and work in South Africa, go, you know, go and work overseas, they suddenly think, well, man, this, there's something here. And suddenly we've got the local, the best and the brightest from our local communities working for wildlife in the national park that's on their doorstep. That's the holy grail of African conservation. You know, that's it. They will look after that wildlife for the next generation or more. There's no doubt about it. And to extend that, you've just perfectly set up now this new project because now that the local communities are so involved and care so much about their wildlife, it just makes sense that you partner with them for rhinos. But first, before we get to exactly what this project is and, and how it all came to be, 
could you take us maybe through a history of what Rhino's experience to really set the foundation of why what you did is so just historic? It really, truly is. So yeah, maybe take us back in time. What have Rhino's experienced in Zimbabwe over the past century, maybe? Okay. So probably here, to, to keep it similar, I'm going to talk about white rhinos, okay? And obviously, we've got the two species here, the black rhino and, and the white rhino. Uh, and they're both gray in Siliki, but anyway, that's another story. But white rhinos were wiped out in our country uh, at, at the turn of the 1900s, right around 1900, 1902. There's, there's, there's always a, a lot of debate about when the last white rhino was killed in, in, in our country. And at the same time, all over Southern Africa, the white, the Southern white rhino, different to Northern white rhino that, that was in Uganda and uh, Sudan, East Africa, the Southern white rhino was in serious trouble. And in fact, uh, by the 1920s, it was thought to be extinct, but a small, very small handful of survivors were found in the Northern part of Zululand and what is called uh, KZN today, or Zulu Natal, around about 20 something were discovered and serious intensive protection was put in, put in place around Susui and Mfalozi game reserves at that time. And from that relic pop population, you know, it's an incredible conservation success story driven by a number of, of, of conservation heroes, including Ian Player, but that population eventually was at its height was around 20,000. So from 20 to 20,000 is fantastic. But what happened when I was a youngster in the late sixties and early seventies was the, the guys in, in Zululand had done such a great job with looking after their rhino. They now started to re repopulate the rest of Southern Africa with their rhino. And in particular, large numbers went to Kruger. And that's where the largest population still is today, is, is in Kruger National Park. But the first white rhinos came back to our country, I believe in like 1970 or 1972. And they went to Mokobo National Park. Quite soon afterwards, they were reintroduced into Wangi. And it was very exciting. You know, in the, the, the 1970s, I was still a kid. But I mean, we used to watch the trucks go past and there'd be all these guys with their uh, felt hats talking Zulu and they'd be driving past the rhino and they'd put him back in the park. By the time I started work in the early 80s in Wangi, I mean, the southern plains of Wangi, southern Wangi's got these, a lot of open savanna grassland areas. You'd go out and you'd see herds of rhino, you know, herds of white rhino, threes and fours and fives all the time, the mittens everywhere. And every evening, you know, it'd be part of what you would see, part of the landscape, you know? And it was fantastic to see them. They were, they were, they were, they really, you sense that they belong there. And the reality was also back at that time is the park didn't have a fence. And they often used to wander out. And they would be amongst, the, and they wander in, in, into the common lands. And I never saw them raiding crops or anything like that. There was, I, I'm, it may have happened. I don't ever remember it happening. But I remember watching local community members from where we work today, uh, herding the cattle and stuff. There'd be white rhino, all the trees over there, and kind of look at the rhino. How cool is that, you know? <laughs> but anyway, what happened is that through the 1980s, there was this onslaught through East Africa and then up to countries down north uh, of, on, on the rhino population. And by the time those rhino populations were so severely decimated, we suddenly had this onslaught hit us and it was in the late eighties and early nineties. And we were completely unprepared. We had never seen poaching like us. I know we had poachers coming to our country uh, speaking French and speaking mm. Swahili, you know, the guys coming from all over Africa to come and shoot out the rhinos. Uh, and there was a rhino war. Uh, and essentially we talk about it as our first rhino war. I, I, I remember 200 odd people killed in that war. A lot of game rangers, a lot of poachers, a lot of people were shot, a lot of rhino, but we lost a huge percentage of our black rhino. And we lost all of our white rhino and wanky. And we were just absolutely mortified, you know? So I believe the last white rhino was killed in the early 2000s, actually not far from where our rhino sanctuary is today, an hour's walk. And very, very sad, you know? So from there, you know, it was always this thing about what are we going to do, you know? And it was, we can't, we've got, there's two or three ways we want to bring white rhino back of doing it. And there's obviously a, a, a wrong way and a right way. And it was clear we've seen some rhino, white rhino reintroductions that have been done in recent years in other countries where these white rhino have been bought and they've been free released into larger landscapes and the government based law enforcement agencies have been left to look after them and uh, been a terrible failure. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps we need to rethink that model. And that was when we started saying, well, you know, the communal lands around Wangi are part of the Wangi ecosystem, very much so. They're not Wangi National Park, but they're part of the Wangi ecosystem. So perhaps let's think about bringing white rhino back into the ecosystem as opposed to the national park. Let's put them on the communal land and uh, maybe communal people can, as custodians of these animals will look after them a lot better than government employees might. And that was where this thing first started coming. We'd, we'd, we'd got the community-based tourism going and we're always looking for 
how can you give it a boost? You know, we still got very, very low occupancies in our lodges is one example. People, a lot of tour operators of market tourism, you know, they still can't get that. You're not in the national park, you know, you know, I want to be in the national park. That's how you do safari, you know? So, so we've, we really have struggled with it and we're a little bit further away, a little bit harder to get to. So maybe having Rhino here might be a way to kind of help that. And, and without a doubt, having Rhino creates a whole bunch of jobs and jobs, everything in a community where unemployment is 90% or 95% unemployment. So you can create jobs. That's, that's, that's just a winner right there. So, so these are all these kind of things we were thinking about. At the time, going back five years ago, when we first started talking about this project, back then we were first dreaming up having, building a new clinic quite near to where we are. And I was always going to think, how oh, are we going to fund this clinic? You know, we can, we can raise money and build it, but now you know, clinics need a lot of money to keep them working. And obviously we're so remote here, I've been sport, we're going to get some government is perhaps not going to be enough. So here was a, you know, looking for revenue generating schemes to, to fund the, the clinic and it's something other than you know, chopping down firewood or selling more hunting permits or something, you know? So, so th these were the kind of, all these things that kind of got us all thinking about bringing uh, about Rhino. At, at first, I mean, I can say it openly now is that our authorities looked at us and said, no, this is not going to work you know? mm. because uh, the communities are the poachers, you know? So why would you want to put something as valuable and as rare as a rhino amongst the community? They're going to poach them. I said, yeah, but you don't understand. You know? We've got some communities down there a little, a little bit different, you know? And again, we were struggling with building support at all kinds of levels. But fortunately, one of the, one of the big steps was I was looking to get rhino and I thought, okay, we need to get them from South Africa, you know? And then the guy said to us, hey, you know, the folks down at Malalangwe, it's uh, one of the private conservancies in the south of South of our country, they've got rhino, you know, and they really do it right. You know, they haven't lost any. Why don't you go and speak to them and link up with them? And when I first started talking to them, they were very, very interested. But, but I, but also, frankly, kind of, yeah, really, you think you could pull this off? And kind of what they sent me off with well, after our first meetings was to say, look, if you could prove capability, do it. Yeah, we'll support you. But first, we have to prove capability, and that's what's taken a long, long time. You know, we had to show people that. Not only were we capable of looking after Rhino, but capable of looking after Rhino very, very well. Because that was, that was always going to be the thing. You know, if we lose a bloody Rhino, this thing is probably just going to be, going to be dead, and, dead in the water, sadly. So that was how this thing kind of started. So then to put more of these pieces together. So like, the, 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 what's the how? So like, how did, where did the Rhinos come from? How did they come? And then also... Something that's a big question for me, and I'm sure everyone listening, and you've kind of alluded to as well, how are they staying protected? So what are all of these pieces? Just like you said, yeah. don't just bring rhinos back. Yeah. There's so okay. much that goes into this. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't tell you the amount of thought and, and, and effort and planning that, that went into it. And a lot of people involved too, a lot of people with a lot of experience, you know, a lot of brainstorming and that kind of stuff. But at, at the end of the day, the project we figured out is a project we figured out. And when I say we, I say we with the communities, you know, and our guys. And we said, okay, what's going what's gonna to work here? And amongst our guys, a lot of people who, who, who well remember the right, well remember what went wrong, you know. And one of the things we were told right at the beginning was, okay, one of the things we said we want to do is 110% protection. Do I want to lose the right? Okay, so, so straight away with that as a central pillar to what the plan needs to be, that's straight away, that cuts out a whole bunch of different things. So what we said we needed to do is we need some area needs to be small. Okay. We're not going to try and protect a hundred thousand hectares or 10,000 square kilometers. Okay. So make the area small that we can really protect. Number one. Number two was let's keep a small number of white rhinos. So we're not trying to look after a hundred of them. Okay. So let's start off with just a few white rhino, small area, and let's guard the heck out of them. And to make it even more difficult, we're not going to hire already trained people, ex game rangers or ex policemen or ex soldiers. We're going to take a young people out of our villages. And we're going to train them. Okay. And one of the specs at the time was to say, okay, we need to train them up to at least British military soldiers, military levels. So, so that would get them to a real sort of an, a high level of a skill level. So when we do get, and a lot of the most, a lot of the rhino poachers that come into our country today are ex soldiers, you know, and often some of them even special forces soldiers. You know, like, and so you're dealing with some really high powered poachers. These are not the, the old bushmeat hunters that we were dealing with you know, 30 years ago. So. You guys need to be very, very well trained. So what we said is, okay, but if we end up with just one small little sanctuary or a hole with a small number of rhino, 
a bunch of guys pretending this is really not a, a free ranging, sustainable population. This is just a paddock with a couple of rhino in. Okay, so we need to build a bigger area that's got a free ranging population, the self state population of rhino. So, how do we get from step one to step five? Okay, and that, again, the thinking there was to say, okay, well, let's build several sanctuaries. Okay, three, four, five sanctuaries. Each sanctuary aligned with a couple of villages. Okay, and it's generating revenue for those particular villages. And they, those particular little villages are custodians of that particular sanctuary. And when we've got three or four or five of these all working together and we proved capability at each of them and we built up the capacity to be able to look after white rhino, then we can think about linking them together. And now we've got a, a larger thing. We've not just got these things we call sanctuary. We've suddenly got a big conservancy. And suddenly now we've got a whole lot of rhino and they're moving around in a larger landscape and, and hopefully breeding and reproducing and creating more rhino, which is what, what the holy grail would be. So that's the plan. And we call it Cricky Community Rhino Conservation Initiative. And that's, that's the, the sort of tenets of Cricky. So yeah, does that answer? I think. Yes. Yeah. 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 And do you have a timeline? Is, is it possible to put a timeline on this or what do you okay. think? Okay, so this is one of the things we've been tearing our hair up with. And all the people have been saying, hey, well, you're going to get right. When are you going to get the right? When are you going to get the right? And eventually after, <clears throat> when we started five years ago, I never thought it would take five years. I had no idea. Now, of course, apart from it being a heavy lift was we had COVID in between. So we had two years of COVID. And that just threw a complete spanner in them works. But I, I can really say is that it was during the COVID years that we probably got the most traction and got the most done. And again, that's a tribute to our local communities. You know, they were saying, well, okay, the tourists aren't here now. Okay, so what can we do to help encourage the tourists to come back? Uh, okay, well, let's get these rhino in. Okay, so that was always the big thing. Okay, let's get this rhino century done now during COVID. And we never thought it'd be two years either. It was going to be six months. Or anybody else, did, but that's what we thought. So, so that was always the thing that went on. And essentially, Cricky was a product of the COVID years. Uh, which I'm kind of proud of too. You know? So all of Africa, tourism was in, uh, you know, uh, wildlife conservation that was based on, on, on uh, tourism support was struggling. Mm -hmm. But over here, we've got an area where it was actually flourishing and, and becoming innovative with new stuff. You know? So it was kind of cool. So I'm kind of proud of that too. So that's one of the things that came up for me. I know you, you've got a, a couple of maps. It might be helpful to, to throw one of those maps up. Do you want to yeah, kind of yeah. explain that thing Maybe. I was talking about with this concept? Okay, let me so share my screen. Perfect. Can you see that? Yeah, there it comes. Super duper. Okay. Obviously, left hand one is Africa showing Zimbabwe and South Central Africa, for those of you not familiar with it. And then that central map is exciting too. And I haven't even spoken about that. This, I believe, is maybe the most exciting conservation initiative on the planet today. I mean, it's huge. The idea of linking together all of our protected areas in five different countries, okay? And we talk about these things as being trans-frontier conservation areas. And there's several of them in Africa today that are being under development, but this is by far and away the largest. Five countries, 15 national parks. I believe it's 500,000 square kilometers. I think that's right. Half a million square kilometers. It's massive. It is huge. And they make the, this particular one's called uh, Kabango Zambezi. Those are the two major or two of the major water courses there. And within the boundaries of Kaza, which just lines on the map, but now there's over 200,000 elephants, you know, which is by far the majority of the African elephant population on the planet today lies within the boundaries of Kaza. And if you look down in the southeast corner of Kaza, their visionary conservation dream for the future is Wangi National Park. And what's cool about that is Trins Robbins' game reserve that was started in 1914, which later was incorporated, incorporated into Wangi. And these were the first, these are the oldest protected areas of what is Kaza today. You know, these are the first areas where the hunting stopped, you know, where the ivory hunting that was the big thing going on in the early 1900s and, and obviously rhino as well. That's why the white rhino was completely shot up. And down there, you can see Wangi National Park, which is this fantastic place that is so close to my heart. And if you see there, Wangi's there and all, along the Southern boundary of Wangi is a communal areas where, where we work. And that's Chilocho communal land, which is actually definitely the largest interface of people and wildlife on any national park in our country, and in particular Wangi, we've got about well over a hundred miles of large numbers of people, large numbers of wildlife and, and big wildlife, elephants and lions and stuff, you know, living side by side. 
and it's certainly one of the biggest human wildlife conflict areas within the whole of Kaza. It's, it's really, it's a, it's a hotspot. And that's where we are working. If you want to flip to that other one, I believe it says something like project area. And, Is it this one? Uh, that's it. There you are. So you can see that kind of dark green line that diagonals from the lower left up to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the Wangi National Park boundary. And north of that line, you can see all those water holes inside the park. And sort of to the south of that line, that's the communal land. And that's one of the things that was also a pillar of, of Cricky, you know, this rhino program of ours, is that we've already been working with these communities for so many years. And each one of those icons there marks some kind of project that we've done in that area. So this is not a wow. new project. This is adding in something that we already do. Though, for instance, our smile and sea safaris will bring in dentists and eye doctors from overseas. They've been operating for 11 years in that area. They did their 31,000th patient last year, you know, so we've treated over 31,000 people. You know, our book initiative delivered its 68,000th curriculum school book this year. And I believe our spread is, it, it's over a hundred schools, you know, so this is the scale of the community projects that we are running. Within Wangi Park, we've been doing all kinds of game water supply projects, fire protection, all kinds of stuff for you. So we've already got a really big footprint in here. And adding Rhino, we're just adding Rhino as another element to this, to this big project that we run here. I believe the next picture there that I sent you, there you go, brilliant. Okay, super. So this kind of lays out, if you look at uh, the left-hand side there, phase one, you can see this is just a schematic of that map I just showed you, which is Wangi National Park on the north there. That line, that diagonal line running across the page there is uh, the boundary, or not the page, but that, but that map. And then on the south side is the common land. You can see up in the very top there, you can see sanctuary number one. Okay, that's the Ndamu sanctuary. That's the one that's on the ground now that is operating. It's functional if it's, if it's working. Okay, phase two, you can see the development of a second sanctuary there. Okay, and phase three is a third and a fourth perhaps. And phase three... That's the uh, linking together of those sanctuaries into a logic conservancy along the boundary there. And then uh, it says phase three, it should say phase four is perhaps one day the Holy Grail. One day we might be able to open up these rhino, let them roam back in Wangi National Park here. Once we've proven capacity to be able to protect them. And of course that's, uh, and you asked the question earlier, and I'm sorry, I digress. You asked how long is it going to take? And right from the beginning, you know, we said in phase one, I thought it was going to take a year or two. Mm. Uh, it took five years. So how long, how long is a piece of string? You know, it's just the critical element here is that we can't move faster than the communities want us to move. We determined not to force anything down anybody's throats. And the first communities have already come to us further down and have said, hey, we want to get involved in this project. And, and we're actually hard at work now with sanctuary number two. So these kind of things are slowly coming together, but it has to be at the speed of the community. It has to be at the speed at which we can build cap capacity. And frankly, we need funding, you know. So how long is it going to take? I would hope that we might have a second century up next year, maybe a third and fourth the year after, and maybe a short time off that, be able to link them all together into that conservancy. A lot of people have said, you know, it's all long and thin. No, oh, why? You know, that's not really a good shape for a protected area. And again, it's long and thin because that's what communities want. Okay. They've got a, a boundary with the park and they like the idea of having these sanctuaries and these conservancy as being a buffer between them and the animals inside the park. And what is... Very exciting. And in fact, the communities that have taken on sanctuary number two, the thing that really was the, the sweetener was the, I don't know what you call it, the, the, the thing that really, really got the naysayers hooked was the idea of these fences that we have to build to be able to maintain the rhino. These are, are, are electric fences. With a little bit of care and thinking, you can set up these electric fences in such a way that they also stop the problem animals, the elephants and the hyenas from going, from leaving the park and now going into the community. So suddenly now we've got rhino that are generating revenue that can pay for a, something that can stop human wildlife conflict. So if you look at that fence, that phase three there, if you look at that, where we've linked the sanctuaries together, we've got a long thin conservancy, the fence on the Southern side would essentially be a human wildlife conflict fence. So now all the bad animals wouldn't be able to get in, in, in amongst the communities. And of course, again, this, you've got you to understand a lot of people in the West don't understand there are no grizzly bears in California. Why? Because Californians killed them out a long time ago. There are no wolves in Surrey, Devon, because they were killed out a long time ago. So living next door to these bad animals, these big, wonderful animals, but living with them is tough. If your kids have to walk to school, you know, I mean, you really don't want your kids walking and 
past Pride's Alliance to get to school. There's no parent in the world that wants that. So a lot of people in the West believe, oh, it's romantic and charming to live with lions and live with elephants. But the reality is, is that it's, it's very, very tough. And we get a lot of people killed by wildlife in this country every year. The same year Cecil was killed in, in, in this country, in 2015, a young boy, Elton, was killed nearby. And nobody said anything. Elton was eaten in front of his family by a, a very well-known Wangi lion. You know, it was, it was terrible. So it's one thing to live over there and look at wildlife over here. But it's a very, very different thing to live cheek by child with, with the wildlife. Anyway. Yeah, I agree. No, no, no. That's a great digression because I think that it's something that we have to keep just saying over and over. And something I say all the time on the podcast, it's like, I can't judge anybody for how they feel or people who want to poach or like retaliate against this wildlife because I'm not trying to raise a family in this situation. Like we have, so my state is going to be reintroducing wolves and like all of the conflict that's come about just wolves when they the, I mean, just even the conflict alone with wolves is so little for it to cause so much headache and stress here. And I'm just like, well, we don't live with hippos and rhinos and lions. And when I was in Nepal, it was nuts. Like there was t man eating tigers. That's what they called them. And that was an apt description because there was even a tiger I saw the previous day actually killed a person the following day. Like it doesn't get more real than that. And that's just those concepts and just that being reality, I think a lot of people forget, especially those of us in conservation, when we are always trying to advocate for the wildlife, that sometimes it's hard to remember what it's like to actually live with the species and yeah. having elephants. I mean, just even like, quote unquote, problem elephants eating your food. Like what happens if they eat and devastate all of your crops. And like, that was what you were going to feed your family. Like, then what do you do? And when you don't have the resources to just go to Walmart or some box store, it, it's just, it's just the reality of living in these places. I think a lot of people forget when they advocate for stuff. And so every single time that it's brought up, I, I always harp on it more and more because we just need to keep hearing this over and over again, that our cushy lives are not the same of what most of the world is living with. Correct. Yeah. Rook, I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't tell you how, how much I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you 110%. If we cannot address these kind of issues, the world is going to be a, a, a poorer place in the future because we're going to have, have lost most of our wildlife, you know, and where we have failed in addressing these problems with solutions that the community that live with that wildlife are not happy with, the wildlife does not survive. It does not survive. So, yes. <laughs> yes. And like scrolling through more of these photos here. So I can yeah. you tell me the day that the rhinos like this looks amazing. So everybody who's listening, who's not watching right now, there's this beautiful, like the whole community is out. The rhinos are on a flatbed. There's flags. Yeah. Everyone's waving. Can you tell us what it was like for you to bring these rhinos in? Just, just, I just would love to hear it. I can't, I mean, the story on, on its own is Fantastic, you know, and if you if you go back to that earlier photo, the one that you showed earlier, the people within the rhino community, uh, uh, national parks, ecologists who kind of, who are part of the National Rhino Committee and experts within rhino conservation, our country said, look, guys, you embarking on a pretty high risk project, okay, is that we know you're confident and we know that your communities are confident, but we still believe it's pretty high risk. So they said to us, to start off with, they really don't want to give us any females. Okay, because females obviously are very valuable to, to the population in Zimbabwe. And they said, okay, so what, let's just kick off with two bulls. Okay, so you can have two bulls and we'll sign, sign off on, on you guys getting two bulls and then you got to prove that you can look after them. So the folks at Malalangwe, and I, I, and I just can't speak highly enough of them. They, I, in my opinion, they are game managers or par, par excellence, you know. They said, okay, they're going to look for two bulls for us. And they said, okay, what they, they want is they want two youngish bulls, mature but youngish. So they've got a future ahead of them. They want two bulls that have that are, they know are friends because obviously they are living together, and also they probably want a, a couple that are a couple of rhino that are probably from the periphery of the area where they might one day be at be at risk. So these guys came up and this wonderful team down there came up and they said, okay, they they want bull number eight hundred three and bull number two hundred four are the are, are, are the boys for us. And the one bull was an eight year old bull, and the other bull was a seven year old bull. And 90% of their sightings over the past five years had been together. So they're oh, wow. close buddies, yeah. 
anyway, on, on the designated day, I went down the day earlier and the day that was chosen for their capture, the helicopter was due to arrive at seven o'clock and you've got this vast area with a, a large number of rhino. I'm not going to say how many rhino, because that's probably sensitive, but they've got a large number of rhino in a very large area, but their teams got on the ground and by 7.30 that morning, they had located those two bulls. And we came, we darted one, and that was the first one there. That's the bull we now call, actually, let me look at the spectacles he's got. That's, that was the second one, actually. That's, that's Kusasi, because he's got the double notch on his bow there. And there the guys are, but rhino captured today, compared to how we used to do it back in the 80s and the 90s, it's come a long way. And they're really, really well taken care of. But what was, was, was exciting was uh, we got both of these bulls, and now we had to start to, the, the wild run, you know, so we had to start to try and habituate them with people just to try and get them used to people because obviously they're set for a very, very traumatic experience to be carted across the country from one end to the other and, and, and off to this new place where they're going to be surrounded by people. You know? So part of the first step was to keep them for two weeks down there and, they, and get them used to electric fences. It was one of the things they needed to get used to and which, which the folks down there did very, very well. When I went back a couple of weeks later, we then loaded them up. And uh, that kind of that takes you to your next photo there. And this was where we uh, put them on these flat big trucks and we drove them 700 kilometers across Zimbabwe. We drove through the night, you know, because we thought it'd be a little bit cooler and easier for them. A 17 hour drive. Uh, and there you can see the two, the two crates up the, on, on the back there with the dehorned rhino sign on the side. Uh, and when we arrived in our district, when we turned off the tar road, I, I was crying. I was crying. I was <laughs> crying. Crying, crying like a baby. It was such a, such a moment, you know, and all of our Cobras, uh, which is what we name our, our, um, our community wildlife protection unit. So they, they were all there waiting and jumped on the trucks and immediately put a, a cordon of security around our rhino while they drove in. And then we drove through the, I'm, I'm tearing up again. So it was a bit of May. 20, uh, 22nd of May, we drove through the district there and, and people all along the way, there were just people everywhere coming up the roads, young kids. And all that to be very, very careful to tell eight guys you can't shout. They're not screaming because these rhino are stressed to the max. They're in the back of the truck there. Yes, they've got ad sedatives and stuff, but it's, 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 it's not much fun being transported in a, a steel box. So we had these silent crowds. We went past, they were all waving, grinning. And there were 22 vehicle convoy. Man. All these uh-huh. locals, where are saying, local chiefs, the district council, chair people, executive officers. Local dignitaries, just national park staff, national parks, veterinarians, veterinarians, uh, rhino experts we'd brought in, the Balalungwe boys were there, all of us. It was absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, and then we arrived at our, at our sanctuary too. And it was, uh, it really was, it was, a, it was a heck of a day, heck of a day. And I, I think I can say very, very difficult. It was very, very difficult managing people, crowds, managing those rhino long distances, very, very difficult. But. It went off amazingly well. And that, that's, again, that's a tribute to the, the team that we put together to do it for us. Very, very proud of it. So for a timeline, what day was this? So this was the 22nd of May. We loaded on a Saturday, I believe it was a Saturday night. And then they arrived on Sunday morning. So we, we drove through the night. So we, we started loading in the, the first thing we had to do is down at Malang, we, we had to tranquilize them again. They're in the, the holding bones down there, had to tranquilize them. And then half wake them up and get them to walk, load into the crates. And then they're given the uh, long acting sedatives so that they're not too stressed out for the journey. And then you, and you drive them, but you have to monitor them the whole way. You, know, you have to watch in case they slip and fall. Sometimes if, and they're, they're a pretty drugged up state, you know, if they fall, they might fall badly and they might injure themselves or so you, you got to keep them standing up. You've got to keep them so, so they're up on their feet and you got to keep them cool, make sure they're okay. It was very, not, not. Not easy, but like I say, the team we had is quite frankly, one of the best teams uh, around, you know, and supported by a local national parks vet and the ecologists, we really assembled a, a, a team that I was very, very proud of because, and it worked well. Wow. You know, it's just another serendipity just thinking about that. So that was May 22nd. Well, this episode is going to be released on September 22nd. Ward Rhino Day. So exactly, it'll mark the exact same, it'll mark the month, like right on the day, celebrating your rhinos. That's also when this is going to go out. Can you believe that right now, Butch? That's amazing. That is cool. Four month anniversary. Yes. And so let's just also, let's let's tie all of this together. So we spent a really, a long time talking about tourism and then a long time talking about rhinos. 
So how do you see these two exactly marrying together? How do the rhinos support the tourism? And then how does the tourism support the rhinos? Okay. So now what, what happens is that we've got these, these rhino of ours now are, are, are in their first century. And they are now roaming around in the, that's, yeah, if you back up one picture, that, that picture there was that, I spoke about that uh, moment when we drove them in through, uh, in, into the sanctuary, you know, and that was essentially where we said, okay, the first two white rhino back in the Rank ecosystem, mm. you know, and there the Cobra's guys are there. And it's quite seen off that truck went past, he slammed the, sh the gate shut and there they are, they're inside, but they're on com community land. You go to the next picture. This is where we kept them on within a holding boma within their sanctuary for the first row. They were in there for about a month and maybe that was to get them settled down, make sure that they had covered from the trauma of, of the translocation. The guys who, who, who had experience with rhino translocation, black rhino are well known, even though they're extremely rough and tough and wild when they are out in the wild, when they're in a boma situation, which is kind of a captive situation. They tame down very, very quickly. You can have them hand feeding them carrots within two or three days. But white rhino are the exact opposite. They're, they're a lot calmer when they're in a wild state, but when they're, when they're in a, a captive, semi-captive state like this, they, they get very stressed out. So, so we have to keep them in this situation, make sure that they're okay, really get used to people. Because one of our concepts now is when, when, once they were to be released, they're going to be close quarter guarded. So day and night, they've got anywhere between four and six cobras guarding them within 20 or 30 feet of them day and night. And again, this is another element that we've added to that protection model to make sure that we, you know, we can protect them to the very best of our capability. So for them to be comfortable with the Cobras that close, they've got to get habituated to people. Um, and that was, this was part of what was, what was going on here. And I love that picture there because that picture there was, I think they'd been on the ground with us for probably for about a month. This is probably a picture of late June. And there you can see a group of visitors. There's some tourists, some guests. On the left-hand side, and I remember those guys were actually from California. Huh. And the group on the right are local school kids, and they're dressed in blue. I know they come from the, from the high school. So there was a group of kids that came down from our school, just a couple of miles away, and they came down to see the kids. They came to meet Tuza and Kusasa. And Tuza's the larger one. He's the eight-year-old, and Tuza is, is uh, named in the uh, in uh, Cinderella. Tuza means to charge, to strike, it means something you know, really powerful. And Kusasa means tomorrow. That's kind of alluding to the future. Kusasa is the smaller guy. And, and the kids love them. I mean, they've all got favorites. You go to the school and there's endless discussion about who prefers Tuza and who prefers Kusasa. You know which one's their favorite, why? Which is, again, that's exactly what we want, you know. It's exactly what we want. If you go to the next picture, I'm not sure. But, that's, but, but uh, that was while they were in their, in, in their holding bubbles. And there's our Cobras, close quarter guarding them. There's two guys in the front, two guys at the back. And you can see they are trained and equipped up to, you know, the highest military levels, you know, they are able to look after themselves and look after their rhino. We're not going to have guys walking around with poorly armed or poorly equipped. You see the big smiles on their faces too. Mm -hmm. They're very proud of what they're doing. You know, they, they know they are doing something very, very cool. But within a, after that first month, we opened up the gates and it actually took several days for them to come out to get into their larger sanctuary. But eventually they came out and Trisa came out first. He came out and he was just very, very chill when. Kusasa came out and suddenly realized he was out. He, he went off at a bloody gallop. But uh -huh. you know, they've, they've spent the next two months now where they're exploring their new sanctuary, you know, and getting around. And we supplementary fed them a little bit to make sure they, they lost quite a bit of condition during the translocation and, and the boma period, just to get them back up into, into the condition that they, that, that they were in when we originally translocated. We were busy weaning more the supplementary feeding right now. And they are almost going on to a full 100% natural diet now. And they seem to be doing very well. It's just been a slow, careful, steady process game. That's one of the things we don't know how long it would take. You've got to monitor and evaluate and then decide. So we know now with these two riders, it's taken us you know, three months, four months to get to that. And now they're out there and, and every few days we've got guests who are staying at, at our lodges and they book a, a rhino activity. The rhino activity isn't just get in a car, going on, look at the rhinos, take a couple of pictures and then go back and go and, and do something else. It's we really turn it into a fun activity and it, it really is a fun activity. All the ones we've been doing, it just the guests have loved and many of them have said it's the highlight of their safari. They come down to our headquarters area, which we call Hotel Charlie, where we've got a bit of a, you've got some maps and some uh, interpretive displays where they get the story about Tuzum Kusasa, they get the story about Kriki, the Rhino Project, uh, and they meet some of the Cobras guys themselves who are all just uh, really nice young people and love talking about their Rhino and they're proud and love chatting with people from overseas. And then after that, usually in the afternoons and evenings, our experience is that Tuzum Kusasa get up from an afternoon nap and then they go out for kind of a, a walkabout. 
And it's so much fun walking with those rhinos. So usually we link up with those Cobras guys and our guests will walk along with the Cobras guiding them and then you walk along with a rhino. And, and it's, I mean, it's, it's flipping epic. Very often the rhino's eyesight isn't, isn't great. White rhino's eyesight is, is not, but their sense of smell is. And what happens is you can see them. They suddenly sense that there's other people around with the, with the Cobras. They'll usually come over and have a look, you know? And of course, if you're a, if you're not used to it, it's pretty intimidating when a bull rhino walks up to you and you have to stand still, you know, you can't, you can't do anything. You know, the Cobras guys are there and it's pretty much the rhino generally come up and they get a big sniff, have a sniff, try and figure out what they are. Obviously, we obviously smell, tourists smell different to our Cobras. Once they figure it out, they'll often shake their heads a bit and it's really, it's kind of cool. And then they carry on about their, their business. And these two guys really are chums. They play a lot, you know, and there's a lot of uh, play sparring and jostling in the evenings. Uh, go down to the water hole, they have a mud wallow, having a cool time, kick up the heels a bit, you know, it's flipping wonderful to do, you know, and usually around about sunset, they're very nocturnal, white runners, so they're carrying on feeding. Our Cobras guys go into nighttime mode, they've got all kinds of stuff, uh, equipment to, to make sure that they're effective at night in, in terms of guarding their guys. And then the guests have spent several hours on their rhino activity. Now the rhino activity, we charge a separate fee for, okay. Much like when you go and see the mountain gorillas, you pay a, you pay to stay in the area you're at, and then you pay a, a permit fee to go and see those mountain gorillas. Uh, and that permit fee goes into the local coffers. And that's part of what drives a really successful conservation program for the mountain gorillas. Mount gorillas have, have recovered wonderfully from Diane Fossey's years back in the bad old days, you know? So the, the rhino conservation fee that guests pay us partly goes to a, a gate entry fee for the local community that goes into a special fund and the Ward 3 coffers, the Level Ward. And they specifically, even now there's meetings next week where they are voting on using those funds for medicines and for stuff for, for their new clinic. The new clinic is actually opening as we speak this next week and gate fees from here are going straight into funding the new clinic that takes care of the local community. So, I mean, it's fantastic, you know, and obviously the other portion that goes into paying salaries for the protection of these, of, of these rider, it's mainly, it's mainly salaries for the Cobras. So that essentially goes back in the local communities too, because that's money going into these guys' pockets and what do they do with it? They use it to pay school fees and feed their families, you know? So very, very cool uh, how that, how that works. And, and again, it's kind of an, an evolving thing. A lot of people, when we started, we weren't quite sure how we're going to work here. You know? Are you going to do it like this? Are you going to do it like, oh, we're not sure, you know, let's just, we just, we'll, we will figure it out. We'll be sensible about it. And once we start doing it, more defined, like I say, right now, what's working for us wonderfully is uh, two, three hours in the, in the evening. Lots of fun. Wow. You've got a... I would love to come. I'm just like, what? That just sounds like incredible. <laughs> I just, I feel like this is like something I definitely need to experience. I've, so back in my day, pre like in the past life, I was also a zookeeper and worked on this amazing conservation area that helped bred rhinos and is one of the most successful outside of Africa breeding programs for white rhinos. And so they have a very special place in my heart and Oh my gosh. I just need to, I just, I need to come see them. I feel like it's, it's, it's something that I absolutely have to come do. And then of course, then bring all of the rewildology community with me. And like, we can share like the experience, like being with these two bulls would just be, gosh, gosh, Butch, that would just be so special. And just what you've done and seeing this in person, it just, you're such an inspiration. So I tell you what though, you know, people say that it's not me. I'm just a, a part of a team of people, a wonderful team of people. It's just uh, very, very proud of it. This is the perfect segue. So on this show, we tend to get a little personal, and this is definitely going to be a more personal question. And obviously, you've saw, you've seen and you've done so much. I'm sure you've been through hell. I'm sure you've been through everything that we can't possibly even imagine that we would probably have to have a campfire and some gin and tonics to actually talk about or a whiskey or something to actually get through some of your stories, I'm sure. So <laughs> what keeps you going? Why are you still doing what you're doing 30 years later? I love what I do. I mean, I just, you know, you, you don't want to know whenever I'm not around the rhino, you know, I spend half the time calling him up. Today, I spent my day driving back to town so I could have some decent Wi-Fi here. So I spent the day looking after water holes inside Wangi, you know, because we've got, we're into our dry season there. This is what I do. It's what I love to do. I worry a lot about a future where and I've been to parts of Africa where the elephants are gone and the rhinos are gone and where people don't care and people are happy to have them gone. And I worry about that happening in my beloved Wanky. It's a future that I cannot, I cannot, I cannot countenance that as a, as a future. We, we have to do everything we have to do to make sure that does not happen. 
So, and I, but I have fun doing it. I mean, I, I love my job. Yeah, you know, look, the COVID years were awful without tourists, but you know what? They're fantastic years. I mean, we just, we had the whole place to ourselves. We kept busy. We kept taking food out to our communities. We kept looking after our wildlife. We were uh, developing this cricket project. My family, my kids weren't in school. They were homeschooling over the internet. So they were out there with us. It was, we might have been some of the luckiest people in, in the world. Uh, very little COVID out here either. So it was, re- it was still relatively healthy. So I love, I love what I do. I'm mm. lucky too. Really unlucky. This is wonderful. Well, Butch, you are one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. Also being in conservation travel world, you are, you are what it's all about. Like literally you and what you do, like this is why this is a solution for saving our wildlife, saving nature, and also empowering capacity, local people, local communities, and just keeping everything here. So Butch, thank you so much for your time and for sitting down with me and celebrating World Rhino Day with one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, for the opportunity and congratulations. World, World Rhino Day is a wonderful, this is a wonderful thing to celebrate on this day. So thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing you over here one day. You can come and walk, walk, walk with these white rhinos. Yes, I will totally come. And then you can come visit me up here in the mountains and then I'll, I'll show you my wildlife as well. We'll just trade. <laughs> cool. I'd love to see a moose. I've never seen a moose. <laughs> oh, I have plenty. I can take you right now to go see a moose. We will 100% do that and maybe even wolves by the time you get here. So oh, wow. I'll just plant yeah. that seed. <laughs> okay, cool. Now that was an incredible conversation with a true conservation hero. Thank you, Butch, for everything you've done for wildlife and people in Zimbabwe. If you'd like to visit Mvelo's lodges and see these rhinos for yourself, check out the special rhino conservation itinerary put together by The Wild Source. Also, if you'd like to show off your rhino conservation support, be sure to purchase the special rhino t-shirts in the Rewildology store. Proceeds will be donated to KACF for their incredible rhino conservation work. If you have a specific question you'd like to discuss about today's topic, head on over to the Rewildology YouTube channel and submit your question in the comments section of today's episode. We couldn't keep this show going without your incredible support. If you'd like to give the show some love, a few zero-cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter at rewildology.com, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your support. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Heather Bailey, the show's audio and video producer, for making the show sound and look awesome, and Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear we use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.